I want to know the true origins of Islam. So I invited Dr. Peter von Sievers to join me for this episode. He said, as he's been examining the origins of Islam for many decades, that there's an aspect that is not quite understood or studied on the same depth that he has in Islamic origins. And what that is, is the Christology and the Christianities that are in the areas of Arabia and the known world, from Rome, Persia, and down into Arabia. The Saracens and the Arabs, were they Christians? What kind of Christians? And the earliest voice within Islamic tradition is the Quran. We shouldn't trust something coming hundreds of years later to take to the bank. And Dr. Van Sievers clearly tells me, Derek, the Quran is a reaction. Pay attention closely as he educates us on the history. He knows world history, but also specifically this time period very well on what led up to what we call Islam. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I have a special treat, and I mean that. This is going to be highly intellectual, engaging in history, really getting to the bottom of some ideas. And so with that being said, I have a special guest, and that is Dr. Peter Von Sievers. Is it Sievers, or am I saying it correctly? Sievers, yeah. Sievers. Correct. Welcome to Myth Vision. How are you? You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. I want everybody to know he has an academia page. Please go jump on that. I actually joined academia as well. So I have a profile. He has a profile. You definitely want to go there. Many publications he has written and some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, you will find on his academia to dive much deeper into the data. I do want everybody to know as well that you, um, you have credentials at you know Salt Lake City, Utah, but you actually are an emeritus university professor on history, but not That's only right. Middle Eastern history, like world history, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right. Yeah. So you know a thing or two about history. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a historian, a full-blooded historian. Yes. Can you, is there anything I missed in terms of your, um, uh, your education that you might want to highlight for our audience? Yeah. Well, I, um, uh, as you, probably recognized from my accent, I'm, uh, I'm originally from Germany. I studied in Munich and got my PhD there at the university. Uh, but I came uh, already to the United States in 1968, where um, Gustav von Grudebaum invited me to UCLA. And uh, since at the same time, I also found the love of my life uh, and got married uh, to an American who had come to Munich to learn German in order uh, to prepare for her PhD at the University of Chicago. Uh, we got married and I started my career at UCLA. And so then um, I stayed in the United States. Mm, congratulations. <laughs> not, <laughs> not everybody finds the one. Um, okay. What, what piqued your interest, if I may, as we're diving into this, why um, the origins of Islam? Why was that fascinating to you? Um, I... Um, Shortly after uh, uh, finishing high school, uh, a friend and I w wanted to go to Algeria, which at that time was fighting for its independence. Uh, it was impossible to get visa, and obviously it was uh, even more difficult to uh, get into a war zone. And so instead, we ended up in Morocco. But it was so fascinating for me that I, when I came back to Munich, I studied then um, Middle Eastern studies, history, and uh, uh, Islam. And so that's uh, where it all began. Wow. Well, thank you so much for that. And I hope our audience will go down in the description. There is a uh, an episode specifically that caught my attention about Dr. Uh, Sievers. You want to check it out. It will be linked down in the description where he gives a lecture on Islamic origins. Some of this stuff may or may not be mentioned during the episode today, um, but Maybe there's going to be stuff we talk about that isn't mentioned in this lecture. So if you really want to take a deep dive, I really recommend you check that out in any of the other links we have down in the description that will be there so you can go check out the material. With that being said, today's discussion is about the backstory of Islam. Uh, 
the world in which Islam was born in. And to start with, I would like to have a look at the two superpowers at the time, Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. So let's begin with the Byzantine Empire, if I may. This is a map, just so people can kind of get a visual idea on the map, what it would look like. You see the Persian Empire to the east. You have the Byzantine Empire. Constantinople's right here. You see it in the middle. Can you tell us more about this empire? When was it formed? How long did it last for? And who was the emperor during the time of what we call Muhammad? Yeah. Well, so the uh, uh, Roman Empire, we actually have to call it, uh, and scholars are debating forever when uh, one should call it uh, Byzantium or Byzantine Empire. Uh, I usually uh, uh, make the uh, uh, transition at around uh, 610 when uh, Emperor Heraclius came to power. And he was, of course, the one who was beaten by the Arabs when they conquered uh, between um, uh, or in the uh, early 630s. And so uh, at that time, uh, then I say, OK, it was Byzantium. And the reason for that is uh, that uh, Heraclius made himself a Christian king, no longer a Roman Empire. So he changed his titles and so on. So the Roman Empire, of course, was uh, initially pagan, but then became Christian at, in the uh, waning years of the 300s. And so in the 4 and 500s, uh, Christianity then uh, expanded everywhere, and so uh, including also in Syria and um, a, a good portion of Arabia and so on. So by the time, uh, let's say the mid-500s, which would be the period where I seriously begin to look at what, happening, uh, what happened there uh, so that we can then understand half a century later the beginning of Islam. So in the mid-500s, um, uh, the Roman Empire, uh, everybody called it the Roman Empire, even later than uh, the Arabs who conquered called it Rome. And uh, that is, of course, uh, Rome and stood for the Roman Empire. Uh, so uh, it's only we scholars who call it Byzantium from about 610, or well, some call it already Byzantium in the 500s. However, that may be, I mean, that's not important. Uh, the important point, however, is that in the mid-500s, uh, in, in a fierce Christological debate uh, was raging uh, throughout the uh, Roman Byzantine Empire uh, concerning, when I say Christ, Christ, uh, Christological debate, uh, concerning um, uh, what exactly was the crucifixion, uh, who was killed on the cross, and um, the person on the cross, Jesus, did he suffer or did he not suffer? And so there were some Christians. Uh, well, um, we have to say, of course, when Christianity became official in the Roman Empire, there were fierce um, theological debates, uh, including uh, the nature of Jesus and so on. And then, of course, from Nicaea and later uh, Chalcedon on, um, there was an orthodox Christianity. Um, let me call it Chalcedonianism or Chal the uh, Chal Chalcedonian uh, church. Uh, Chalcedon uh, is a city in uh, Anatolia where um, these doctrines were defined and then uh, uh, officially uh, pronounced. So um, uh, the, the debate in uh, the mid-500s was... Um, uh, um, the Jesus who was uh, killed on the cross, was he entirely divine? That was the position of the um, uh, Maya physites, or let me, because that's a very technical term, which I would not want to define. So we are not going into <laughs> the natures of Christ very deeply. Uh, let's say um, the Jacobites, um, after uh, Jacob Bardeus, who was a proselytizer in Syria, uh, converting the Arabs to Christianity. So we have to, we should be sure, and um, uh, I do not believe at all that there were still pagans in Arabia. So there might have been lots of Arab tribes who were not very Christian, perhaps, but what else is new? How many real Christians are around today? So <laughs> uh, there's no point in quibbling about this. Um, uh, Arabia was Christian, 
Okay, so uh, uh, the Jacobites were the majority, and they believed uh, they were what is called Theopaschites. In other words, uh, Jesus um, uh, was nailed to the cross, uh, but because he was, let me uh, be a bit cavalier now with theology, uh, he was God on earth, okay? So he was entirely divine. Uh, he had only one nature that was divine. That's what the Jacobites said. And so when uh, he was crucified, obviously God suffered and died. Mm. That was considered to be scandalous. Uh, and um, efforts were made then, both in the official Christian church of the Byzantine Empire, uh, and then also among a, uh, uh, a group condemned by those who believed in the full divinity of Christ. Um, the so-called Eastern Syrian Church. Later they were called Nestorians. So let me call them Nestorians, even though it's anachronistic. They believed, uh, let me briefly describe their position. They Please. believed that Jesus had two natures, one divine, one human. And when Jesus was nailed to the cross, um, only the human Christ died, uh, suffered and died. The divine uh, uh, Jesus obviously couldn't because God cannot be nailed to the cross, obviously. So the, the second position, which uh, we might describe as, let's say, more rational, uh, but it was very difficult to uh, fully combine uh, the two natures. So there were always debates on well, were there two persons, was, was there one person, how many natures, and so on. Let me uh, make this brief. Uh, the people who later became the Nestorians, the Eastern uh, Christians, were essentially pushed out. This was after Ephesus in 431. Pushed out of the Byzantine Empire and became the Christians in, now we are turning to the Sassanid Persian, Persian Empire. So they settled there and built up the Eastern Christian Church, which continued to adhere to this new nature theory. Now, um, again, long story short, in the course of the 500s, when these fierce debates broke out over the nature of Jesus, uh, the main antagonists were, the, on one hand, the Jacobites, who believed in the single divine nature and therefore in God's suffering on the cross, were opposed by the Easterners uh, or Nestorians who said, no, Jesus had two natures and it was only the human nature uh, in Jesus that suffered and eventually died on the cross. The reason why I'm getting, a, 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 and of course then there was a middle position which the, Byzantine, the Byzantines tried to take because of course they had a strong imperial interest in having all of the different Christian uh, churches essentially then from the second uh, half of the 500s onwards, uh, to be one, under one uh, patriarch in Constantinople. And of course, also there was the Pope or the Bishop of Rome, and uh, also under the uh, Roman Byzantine authority. If so I may, that, just, just to poke in as yeah. we go, because I actually, some of these images okay. actually I have are related okay. to exactly what you're talking about here. So yeah. it was a capital, uh, the capital was Constantinople. This was the church, just so everybody knows, exactly. in Constantinople would have looked like back in, in the time during Muhammad, of course, without the uh, the uh, minarets. So yeah. if you yeah. look good, here... Oh, good, go that, good that you took the minarets off so that one has an impression of the uh, Roman Byzantine period. Exactly. And this right here, uh, obviously, as well, I just want to show an inside look at that same church. Here yeah. you have the Christ, right? Jesus uh, on mm -hmm. the ceiling. And then this is one of the famous paintings we see images on Google when we're looking up Jesus. Uh, we've all seen this, I think. This is inside that very church. The art is absolutely fascinating there. So I just want I want well, everybody. As, oh, go ahead. Uh, why do you have this image? Let me point out, um, maybe one really would have to get close and look at the face. But uh, the face is half human and half divine, if you look very carefully. Wow. So in other words, one half of the face uh, expresses some of the suffering that Jesus uh, experienced on the cross. The other one was the divine Jesus, who, of course, did not suffer on the cross. 
So here, here you have a visual presentation, a representation of this. That's the uh, uh, the position that Ch uh, Chalkidon or Chalcedon took, which is essentially that of the Eastern Christians, but not entirely so. And the reason um, why I mentioned this is now that the Jacobites were uh, outraged in the course of the and I've, I say this deliberately in the in the uh, course of the 500s. And I want to get a little more into the details so that this becomes clear. Mm -hmm. uh, they were outraged that uh, both the uh, uh, Chalcedon, uh, the the, uh, the uh, church that tried to compromise between uh, the two, well, let's call them extreme positions: uh, God being entirely divine and God being half divine, half human. Um, uh, the the uh, uh, fierce debate in in the second half of the 500s was then uh, culminated then in a figure John of Teller so he died in 538 uh, um, uh, he uh, denounced the main person of the Eastern Syriac Church uh, by being another Judas uh, so in other words he. Uh, betrayed the official Christian position, according to which Jesus was crucified. Uh, uh, according to which the Jews crucified Jesus. Now we know better, of course. Um, uh, even, uh, even, uh, I mean, uh, any careful reading of the Gospels makes it clear that the Romans were the ones, not the Jews. But of course, the Jews were sympathetic to the Romans taking Jesus essentially off their hands. That's the right. the, the situation. Now, um, this John of Teller uh, denounced Nestorius by saying he is the new Judas because he dares to say that the Jews did not kill Jesus. And therefore, he is just after his scandalous in the Christian church because we all know that the Jews killed him. So that was the position, the, the polemics of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Jacobites. And the Quran picked up the polemics and also declared, uh, no, um, uh, Jesus was not killed on the cross. Uh, it only seemed to the Jews that way. This is a crucial uh, verse in the Quran. It's uh, 457, I think. Um, uh, I, I made a little note here, uh, uh, 4157, if uh, listeners want to write this down and check in the Quran. It's a crucial verse because already in the year 437, maybe 637, maybe 640. So in the last days of the Arab conquest of Iraq, the bishop of uh, Nisibis at that time, Abiy Abin, uh, Ishayah uh, uh, III, uh, said, uh, had apparently Arab conquerors who informed him what the Arabs were all about. And he said, well, um, uh, the, uh, we should not fear the Arabs who, who are in the process of conquering us, because like we, they do not believe that Jesus suffered and died on the cross. So here you have in a nutshell the beginning of Islam. <laughs> oh, this is great. Okay, I'm going to keep moving here with uh, some images here. I want I want everybody to take a look here at the superpower of the time, the Persian Empire. Uh, this is the map and what it looks like, uh, what it looked like, if you will, just to give an idea. Can you tell us some more about this empire? When was it formed? How long did it last? Or who was the emperor during the time of Muhammad? Yeah, so um, Iran, uh, of course, is a very old empire. Um, way back, um, one of the uh, kings of Iran was even a messiah, in, uh, uh, according to the Bible, uh, because he was responsible for resettling uh, the Jews, releasing them from the Persian Empire, uh, so that they could return to Jerusalem and build the second temple. So there you have a, an old connection between Iran and uh, or the Persian kingdom uh, and uh, Christianity. King Cyrus, but, yeah. Cyrus, right. Now, fast forward, um, the Sasanians or Sasanids um, uh, founded uh, the most recent version of the, of the Persian Empire 
and uh, in the uh, uh, throughout again the second half of the 500s, early 600s, they were uh, in constant war with uh, the Romans or Byzantium, and in fact uh, they were usually more victorious than the Romans. The Romans were quite defensive, and in the last war, the one that uh, um, uh, was led by Hosro the second, so uh, he was then eventually the last king, uh, because uh, he uh, um, was overthrown by the Persians themselves in 628, when the Romans finally under Heraclius were able to defeat him. So in 628, that was of course the turning point. Heraclius was victorious. Uh, uh, Heraclius, the emperor of Byzantium, uh, uh, was victorious. Uh, the Persians were defeated, and so uh, uh, Heraclius wisely, however, because he was not um, uh, completely firmly in the saddle, he had come to power only through a coup in 610, uh, he wisely let the Persians uh, fight it out among themselves, and of course then uh, in the subsequent years um, with a lot of turmoil in, uh, in, uh, among the Sasanians, uh, eventually, the Arabs were able to uh, conquer uh, all of Iraq and then ultimately Iran, and uh, the last king of the Persians uh, then uh, was defeated. Uh, but um, the, uh, the Persian Empire, uh, or the Sassanid Empire, was extremely powerful in the second half of the 500s, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, the Romans or the Byzantines found it very difficult to defend themselves. Now, because Iraq, so the western portion of the Sasanid Empire, was Christian in its majority, and Ctesiphon, the capital, uh, or Madain in uh, Arabic, uh, was, yeah, that's a. Yeah, very nice I'm just, I might picture. as well just go through it so people can right. actually see these. Yeah. And, and, and your viewers should actually compare it to the Agia Sophia in, uh, in uh, Constantinople because it is just as impressive and imposing, showing you the enormous power that the Sasanids possessed. Yeah, there you are. I just I wanted to show what a recreation would have looked like. That's reconstruction, the, right? Yeah, that's what it yeah. would have looked like. This is what we have left, just to give you an idea. Yeah. Now, the Christians in Iraq. So those Eastern Christians who were denounced as um, followers of um, uh, Judas, uh, believing in the two nature. <laughs> followers in, in, of Judas. In the two nature uh, uh, theology of, of Jesus. And, and that was, even though it was a polemic, uh, originally a polemicism of the uh, Jacobites in, in Syria, it was picked up by the Arabs who were forming the Islam in the, uh, in the first decades of the 600s. Um, uh, if you want to, we can come back to this, quote, formation of the, of the Quran as well. But it is important to be aware that already in 637, so in other words, about um, five, uh, eight years, well, 632 is a traditional date of the death of Muhammad. I'm not so sure, it might have yeah. been earlier, uh, but that's a secondary question. Uh, be this as it may, it was just a few years after the death of Muhammad. Already at that time, uh, the Christians in Iraq knew, uh, via Isha uh, yeah, the third, knew what all of these conquering Arabs were all about. In other words, they were, well, Christian, but maybe not quite um, along the official line. But who represented the official line anyway? Kalsidon? But they were contested by the uh, Maya Fizites as well as the Eastern Christians, although they were outside the empire, and so therefore they did not have any particular uh, power political uh, connection with uh, the, uh, uh, the business. Nevertheless, Heraclius made an effort to re-invite the Eastern Christians into the larger church, Chalcedon. Uh, uh, Heraclius was... Um, almost desperately concerned to bring the Christians back together, particularly after he had lost um, Syria to the Arabs, which uh, happened by 640. 
So at that time, he was just desperate to reunite all of the Christians in order to have something to resist the, uh, uh, the Arabs. Mm. So um, uh, ask me further questions. Yeah, and- yeah. So, so during that time, um, there was a version around this, this period, if you don't mind, like a version of what we call COVID-19. It was the Justinian plague, which caused huge devastation across the empire. Can you tell us more about this plague and the scale of the de- devastation this pandemic caused? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one cannot draw um, any particular connection between uh, the plague and uh, the, uh, the Christological developments that, that we have just been talking about. Nevertheless, it, it happened at the time of Justinian. And Justinian was also, like Heraclius, uh, already at that time, so 550 uh, years or 70 years earlier, uh, very concerned about either keeping Christianity together or getting uh, all of the Christian denominations back together. And so it was right in the middle of his uh, tenure that uh, the Justinian plague occurred. Uh, We are still not exactly sure from where it came. Uh, Belief now is, so here I'm putting on the hat of the world historian, so to speak. Um, Historians um, uh, think maybe that it came from East Asia, but that is uh, still debatable. uh, furthermore, it's also not completely clear how that uh, plague developed because, of course, we know uh, one form of the Black Death is connected with rats. Another form is uh, transmitted directly and doesn't need the, uh, the rats. So whatever the background there, it was, of course, devastating in the middle of the or second time of the 500s. Uh, but it was uh, a first cycle. We don't know how many uh, were killed, but what is important is there were repetitive cycles um, reaching way into the 700s. And an interesting detail here is that the Umayyads, the first Khalifa dynasty who came uh, to power in 660, uh, they uh, suffered these periodic uh, recurrences of the uh, Justinian plague. And instinctively, they uh, instinctively they knew that um, they shouldn't stay in the cities on the coast of Syria so or in the interior. So we're talking about Caesarea, Damascus, Jerusalem, uh, Hens, um, whatever. They shouldn't stay in the cities, but uh, should go into the clean air of the desert where the, quote, vapors of the Black Death would hit them. And that's actually part of the background for the Umayyads having these wonderful castles in the Syrian desert uh, that, <clears throat> that are um, architectural jewels, also the, the paintings there. I mean, we all think that Islam is aniconic or against images. But the Umayyads were great lovers of frescoes, uh, even of uh, the naked body and of, wow. um, uh, of uh, banquets and what have you. So that's the result of the uh, recurrent cycles. So every 20, 30 years. And uh, eventually the Black Death petered out only in the maybe the 720s, 30s. So we can assume that the overall population in Syria and in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean um, it was um, considerably reduced. Uh, in fact, the, this Black Death actually reached uh, also as far as Western Europe. So um, uh, it was quite devastating. Wow. Okay, uh, so now we're getting back into zooming in from world history back into what's going on with this development. And I actually, it wasn't too long ago, interviewed Dr. Michael Penn. I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah. He, uh-huh. Okay. So we, we talked about this and, uh, you know, he mentioned the largest church in the Middle East was the Church of the Syriac Christian. And they, within themselves, had different sects. So if I can, I'd like to show a few examples of like these different kinds of of uh, sex, and I might have a hard time pronouncing this. You can help me here, but the monophysitism is that how you say it? Monophysitism. Monophysitism. Yeah. And what is this uh, doctrine? What are they teaching? Okay, so here we are back to uh, what I was talking about a little earlier: the Jacobites. So the monophysites in Syria were called Jacobites. 
Okay. Uh, they were also predominant in Egypt, and there we call them also monophysites. Uh, I prefer the term myophysites, okay, mm. rather than mono. Maya means one. Mono was uh, was is already a sort of a compromise uh, that was uh, concluded at the beginning of the 500s by uh, Severus, uh, who was a bishop of Antioch. He also, uh, he was inclined toward this reconciliation that Justinian wanted to bring about. And so there were periodic efforts by the emperors and the patriarchs of Constantinople to bring those monophysites or myophysites or Jacobites. These are all identical. Right. Just like uh, the Saracens and the Arabs. and Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the Tayyai, by the way. And, <laughs> and, uh, so there we go. So the uh, uh, periodic efforts by the emperors to bring those uh, monophysites or myophysites back into the fold, but then... Uh, uh, the Mayophysites always resisted very strongly, and sometimes they were, or well, most of the times, they were aggressively opposed to mm. both the Chalcedonians, or the main imperial church. That and that, to, that would be these people, uh, it seems on the far left, two on, unified natures. Chalcedon, two is the far left, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, let's stick with this picture for a moment. Yes. I, I try to avoid this business about... Um, two natures, one nature, and so on, by saying uh, Christians who said Jesus had only one nature, and that's, of course, the far right divine, uh, which in many ways is the, um, how shall we call it, the, the most natural attitude uh, anyone would take towards Jesus, because um, any person one looks at um, obviously has only one nature. I mean, we are talking now here, and I presuppose in my conversation with you that you are not split into into two natures. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so the common sense attitude is uh, that Jesus could have only had one nature, and of course, if you have to choose between the two, he had to have a divine nature. That's the most natural position one could take, and so therefore. That was the reason why the Myophysites or the uh, Jacobites were so uh, attractive in the 500s and why they had so many supporters and why the Chalcedon Church was so much on the defensive. Now, the one uh, people with the uh, two, what, what is called here, two, two, two separate sep natures. Two separate nature, Nestor. Unfortunately, this is wrong. Um, uh, Nestorianism does not talk about two separate natures. It talks about also, uh, uh, well, it talks about two natures, but it talks about one person in whom these two natures came together. <laughs> so that is very different. And obviously it's at, as close as these guys with the two nature people uh, could come to the idea that, uh, that uh, the the common sense approach that anybody would take is that Jesus was divine. Nevertheless, it was very important for the Nestorians to say, now, wait a minute. Um, it is incredibly important that uh, Jesus had a human nature because otherwise uh, we cannot explain the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross. And anyone who... Uh, is uh, not prejudiced and reads the Gospels, particularly Matthew, well, Mark just as much, is struck how human Jesus is in mm -hmm. the Gospels. In fact, uh, I grew up as a, as a Lutheran Protestant. For me, it was completely natural that uh, Jesus was primarily human and only secondarily divine, because how could he have saved me or, or the other Protestants uh, how could he have, have saved him, uh, saved us, unless he had sacrificed himself? So you can see here how uh, how one's feelings are torn, really, mm -hmm. between the one and the other Jesus. And so I'm I'm commenting here, by the way, very sympathetically about theological positions. You see, right. uh, I'm not talking about a historian in this particular case. Uh, I'm talking here about very neutrally about why it is that we uh, 
uh, on one hand, want to be Jesus, to be human. But on the other hand, why it is also very important that he is divine. Now, back to the 500s. Because the um, Myophysites or the Jacobites were so aggressive, uh, we can say in an overall sense, uh, there was a development in antiquity. So from 30, when we assume uh, Jesus was crucified, 32, 70, when uh, the uh, uh, Jewish uprising was uh, violently suppressed by the Romans and all of the Jews were driven out of, uh, of Jerusalem. From that period on, in all antiquity, the more, more aggressive development was towards the divinization of Jesus. So Islam uh, came at the culmination when this divinization process occurred. And Islam is, of course, the backlash. Okay, uh, Jesus was made human again. Now, the Nestorians were the ones who had engaged in the backlash already much earlier. But they were, of course, driven out into the Persian Empire. And so, therefore, they were ineffective in the Byzantine Empire. That is why they, the uh, uh, Jacobites and Maiaphysites were so powerful in Syria. And... It is very clear, and uh, I, I cited this issue yeah, at the beginning with this uh, famous verse already in 437 uh, that uh, indicates there was an awareness of uh, what is called theopaschism, that is, um, uh, God died on the cross and uh, suffered uh, before he died. That position was victorious, really, but Islam is a counter-reaction to this. So because technically, it, if I may, just to, I'm yeah. a lay person. I really just barely am scratching the surface here, and and I'm wanting to know if I'm right. So this gentleman here, Heraclius, who right. is like literally desperate, decides he's going to reach over to the eastern side, or really it's the western side of the Persian army or empire, where where this is the king who who gets end up usurped and whatnot, and get these. What we keep calling, uh, let me get this uh, image back up here, the the Maya the Maya fights. No, uh, no, he he wanted to get the Nestorians. Nestorians, okay. The middle, middle. The people. middle. Even though this isn't completely accurate, it's still he's trying to get the Nestorians to come back, and so there's all of this theological war going on, uh, but 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 also political. You can't divorce the two; they're one and the same. And here is these Arabs who are actually going along with making it's a reaction to divinity to the point where no he is not a son of god no he is not god um you know god is not do not make jesus god at all so it's reactionary completely reactionary exactly yeah wow so, so this this is what my uh, by the end of the year i i hope i will be finished with the manuscript of my book that is where I, uh, where my book begins. And that is why uh, I, if I'm maybe proud for a moment of my research, <laughs> uh, that is why I think I have something uh, important, new to say that no scholar uh, who is uh, writing at the same time, and uh, particularly the scholars whom you have interviewed, because in many ways, they are also um, uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to pre present a new picture, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm definitely um, presenting a new picture, and so that's what I'm after. Wow. Okay, let's keep going because there's so many good things. I have so many questions. I would like to move on to the border patrols, if you don't mind, because we're talking about the differences, and you did a wonderful job explaining that. I was going to ask: Is there any other group of Christians that we didn't mention that might? might be just before we left that that are not really popular aren't really mentioned but they're there and the reason i ask in light of this all of these groups you're talking about are they all using the canonical text because it seems like there's awareness of literature in the quran like pseudepigraphical literature that we i thought that was extinguished i thought that in the three four hundreds they had gone around and completely destroyed all of this heretical literature, but I'm seeing Jesus turn clay birds into life. Like what's going on? Is that literature still around and what groups of Christians maybe are reading this? Oh yeah. No, that, that literature was definitely around. 
Uh, you're right, of course, uh, once Christianity was adopted in the Roman Empire, so the, the late 300s, and once the great um, uh, proselytization conversion efforts of the Christian church uh, had been completed, and that was in the course of the 400s, um, uh, the uh, Christian church, the Chalcedonian church in Constantinople was successful in suppressing um, uh, literature that it considered to be unorthodox. So whatever they, uh, the, the patriarch and the emperor decided did not fit into the canon uh, was uh, suppressed and it went underground. But of course, there were lots of Christians in the East uh, who continued reading them, continued even writing uh, such question, so-called questionable texts. Uh, there was then also the Judeo-Christians for, for a while, that is, uh, Jews who uh, nevertheless recognized Jesus as the Savior, uh, but continued to practice uh, Jewish uh, customs and laws. So um, uh, all of this uh, went on, and we should be the, uh, we should be very much aware that uh, the uh, Orthodox dictate, so to speak, by the emperors and, uh, and the patriarch in, in Constantinople uh, was by no means successful. And so that is quite uh, understandable. But let me mention also, uh, since you asked a little earlier about, uh, is there any other Christian group uh, that yeah. is of, of relevance? Let me mention it. And that is, again, um, uh, this is new. Nobody has really uh, uh, written about it. Uh, in uh, we were talking earlier about Justinian and the Justinian plague. Justinian, as I said, was, uh, well, I exaggerated, it was desperate, but we want I to- I get the point. <laughs> we want to make it a little, uh, a little livelier uh, to bring the Christians together. So he uh, dictated a uh, piece of uh, liturgy, which is called the Thrice Holy, 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 uh, which is sung in the regular liturgy of Skalcidon, where the middle verse was uh, at the behest of the, you can see here again how important the Myophysites were, um, at, the, at the demand, not behest really, I mean, uh, they were really insistent on this, it was changed. And this middle the liturgy was sung, holy, a uh, holy who was sacrificed for us. Now, if you listen to that liturgy, it means God was sacrificed, uh, suffered and was sacrificed on the cross because God is the holy, 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 holy God. Um, so the middle verse, therefore, then officially in the Chalcedon Church, Chalcedonian Church from uh, Justinian onwards had to be sung that way. So um, just in passing. Um, we are not talking about highfalutin to nature and uh, uh, one person and what have you theologies. And this is so unfortunate uh, because you cannot really represent it accurately like your uh, graph showed. Uh, it's, it's not very accurate. Uh, so I want to bring it down to earth. Uh, the people in church, when they went to mass, either daily or, or on Sundays, literally sang that God on earth, so to speak, who was Jesus, was suffered on the cross and died. That was sung every day. Now you can see here why the reaction of the Muslims was so visceral, because uh, later on, uh, because of the uh, what I call the backlash, because of course in the late five five hundreds, early early six hundreds, when uh, everybody had to sing it that way, including Chalcedonians, um, the. Uh, uh, we have to be aware that the bishop, uh, that some of the bishops and monks of Jerusalem were vehemently opposed to the singing of the what is called the Trisagion, uh, the Holy, 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 with the middle verse. So in Jerusalem, there was a furious resistance in, in the clergy and, in, and among monks in the 620s, early 30s, Bishop Sophronius is uh, uh, very crucial here, the one who actually um, uh, turned the keys of Jerusalem over to Omar, who was uh, the uh, caliph at the time, conquering it. 
So they were furiously opposed to the singing of the goddess divine and suffered uh, uh, liturgy. So we have actually a complication here in Jerusalem. And I'm saying, yeah, that was picked up by uh, the, the Arabs of southern Syria. So here we are turning to something we haven't mentioned yet, and that is the Christians of southern Syria um, and adjacent uh, northern, northwestern Arabia uh, had a capital, Petra, of course, famous for its, its, uh, the ruins which one can visit in Jordan. Petra was probably, uh, cannot be proved um, without some doubts, but probably was the city in the vicinity of which uh, Muhammad, if we think that he was the unnamed preacher in uh, the early 600s, where he received the, the beginning of the Quran, the early revelations. So he received them in Petra, not in Mecca. Mecca did probably not even exist. The first time it, it was ever mentioned as existing dates to 692. So this is way later. Uh, in an apocalypse, uh, the so-called Edessene apocalypse, that was uh, published at that time at the end of the 600s, when the conquests were long over and Islam was beginning to form. So um, if we assume that the earliest revelations came to a preacher, later called Hamid, but unnamed in in the early or in many por portions of the Quran. I shouldn't say early, by the way, because I don't believe in it uh, either. But that's a different point. You can ask me about that later. Okay. So if we assume that an unnamed preacher lived in Petra or environs, I, I call the area Madian, um, uh, uh, or uh, the Romans called it um, uh, uh, Palestina Tertia, the third Palestine. Uh, Madian is the, the old uh, biblical description because the Midianites, of course, are very important in the, in the Old Testament. Um, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, in that particular area where I think the Quran was revealed and where, where the, Ar the particular Arabic that the Quran represents uh, uh, was uh, developed, I mean, that's where it originated. Uh, probably in the 500s. Uh, Marijn van uh, Putten might have told you about that, uh, uh, although I don't know. I mean, that's one of his uh, uh, points, although he is uh, not at all in favor of the uh, Madian uh, theory that I mentioned. Anyway, if the Quran indeed began there, it is very likely that uh, uh, this uh, early preacher, whom, of whom we have to think that he was highly sophisticated theologically, so he had read not only the canonized Gospels, but also the suppressed literature. Um, one basic methodological principle always, uh, apart from working only with historically verifiable records, uh, is that one should always think of protagonists being uh, of the highest sophistication. They are never dumb or uneducated. So Muhammad, this not, uh, nameless preacher in the in some portions of the Quran, clearly has to be supposed to be fully familiar, including the Jeru the Jerusalem uh, patriarchs or bishops uh, who opposed the Trisagion. So in other words, in a way, Jerusalem was Nestorian, and that's why I am so uh, interested in this connection of what the Nestorians had to say about um, Jesus suffering on the, uh, and dying on the cross, not God suffering. That's why um, it is so interesting that this Jerusalem position is exactly the position that then reappears in the Quran, because the Quran is not entirely clear about uh, whether uh, there wasn't also a divinity in Jesus. Um, if one carefully reads uh, the, the particular verse that uh, speaks about the Jews did not kill uh, um, uh, Jesus, it does not deny that, uh, key, uh, that Jesus was not divine. It merely says the divine Jesus couldn't be killed, and that's why the Jews were wrong. 
So that's a completely different uh, um, uh, position. So that's why it is so important to say, okay, Petra is uh, part of the picture and that's where the early revelations began. And we don't even know whether there was any Meccan connection. It could be that this preacher in uh, way north, eventually in 6, 620, 622, that's of course when, uh, when uh, uh, the rise of Medina begins, that's the, the famous hijra, uh, that he made a hijra from the north to Medina, not from Mecca. And that Mecca came into existence only, only later, perhaps by dissidents from Medina. But that's a different story and um, uh, that's a bit speculative and I don't want to go into. This is uh, fascinating. I'm going to keep going because some of the stuff you're mentioning is relevant to what we're going to get into and I'll have more questions, of course, as well. So let's move to the border patrols real quick between these two empires, the what we call Byzantium or Byzantine and uh, Persian real quick here, just to yeah. give people a visual. And uh, I'm going to probably butcher the names, but I'm going to try the Gassan, the, the Gassanids. Uh, right. In Arabic, you would say Rasanids. Rasanids and the yeah. Lakhmids. And who the were Lachmids, yeah. Lachmids, who were Romanized Arabs and person, personalized Arabs. And we have an inscription for these Romanized Arabs from 568 AD in southern Syria. But before I show those inscriptions, here's a modern day analogy uh, for our viewers so they can understand. And I want them to see this little post here. Uh, this is Arabic and French, uh, the sign. Here is that sign in Lebanon right now, which uh -huh. is in French and Arabic. Uh, as Lebanon was under the French rule, and in Lebanon, French in their second is their second language. Likewise, I'm going to show you an inscription in South Assyria from these Romanized Arabs. And this is something that uh, I believe was in Robert Hoyland's work, just to give people the inscriptions on the wall here. But also, here it is in black and white, so you can actually read what's going on. And uh, you can see right. on the left the inscription in Greek. And on the right, in Arabic, can you tell right. us more about these Romanized Arabs, uh, the uh, Ghassanids, if I will? Uh, when were they formed? How long were they around for? Who was their leader during the time of Muhammad? Yeah. Um, well, the the long uh, uh, centuries of war between uh, the Roman Empire and uh, and the Persians, uh, of course. Uh, required that both empires had to think about how would they fortify their borders in order to uh, discourage um, either side from, from attacking. And so uh, initially the Romans built, of course, uh, the famous Limes, L-I-M-E-S. Um, there is a scholarly debate about how, uh, how much the Romans um, uh, thought of it as being a defensive bulwark I don't want to get into this uh, to specialize, uh, but uh, let's say uh, it was sort of a, um, a buffer area where there were lots of forts and, uh, of course, also well-built roads uh, where the Roman soldiers could march and so on. So that was the initial uh, way of defending themselves against the Persians. Uh, the uh, the Persians, uh, because they were usually the attackers, uh, before then uh, they were beaten back, uh, they did not build a, um, a huge um, fortification. They relied right from the start on the so-called Lachmids. And they were Arabs who were then, of course, Christianized and became the Nestorians, uh, about whom we have been talking before. So they had, the, they had a capital there, uh, Hira, which... Uh, is right there in on the western border uh, uh, today of Iraq, where actually the um, Sasanids encouraged the emergence of a kingdom. And so the Lachmid kings were quite powerful. And in the course of the 500s, again, we are talking here about uh, Justinian. Mm -hmm. Justinian's, uh, Justinian was the decisive person there, decisive person there. Uh, although um, uh, uh, he was not the first one who. Uh, made that decision. Um, Dusinia decided that it was too expensive to uh, maintain the limits because uh, he had, had to have troops in these um, 
uh, fortifications uh, in the watchtowers. Um, uh, troops had to be uh, stationed there and exchanged. They had to be paid, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So he decided that it would be probably much cheaper uh, to turn over the defense, similar to what the Persians did with the Lahmids, to the Rasanids. So the Rasanids emerged in the course of the 500s. But they, so when uh, Syria became Christianized, the Rasanids became um, Jacobites. Here we are again uh, with the Monophysites. And so they were a, uh, a defensive force whom the uh, Romans uh, supported, uh, gave important titles to. They became what is called phylarchs. And uh, eventually, even in, this, uh, in the middle of the 500s, they became uh, kings as well, or were called that way. And uh, let them fight it out among themselves uh, before then either the Persians or the Romans would have to interfere with their own troops. So that is what happened also in the second half of the 500s. And it's extremely important, this development, yeah. because, of course, it helped the Christianization of the Arabs. But again, you see, uh, I'm insistent here. It's not just that they became Christian. It's that they became Mayaphysites. And the Quran is forever um, uh, uh, attacking the Mayaphysites in it. So you can see here, this is uh, the backlash phenomenon that I mentioned a little earlier. Um, the, uh, the Quran uh, speaks about what is called in Arabic, mushrikum literally meaning those who associate God with other beings. Um, this is simply the Arabic term for the Mayaphysites, because, you see, uh, Muhammad was a preacher when he received his revelations. He was just like the people who went to church and listened to the or sang the Trisagion. Um, he did not... Um, write theological treatises. He wrote a, a homiletic uh, text collection. In other words, uh, he preached it to the Arabs uh, in probably Petra or environs, uh, uh, Midian, as I said a little earlier. So anyway, they are north, Northwest Arabia. He preached it to them. And the Rasanids were the ones who were the Mushrikun, who, who associated other beings with Jesus. So the, the Quran is really a backlash against the Mushrikun, those who uh, add people to God, and that means uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. There is no Trinity. That is the uh, strong backlash position that you find represented in the Quran. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so we got the the Lachmids and the uh, I can't even... Ras, Rasan. It's like, uh, well, it's not a sound you have in the English language. Yeah. <laughs> but you pronounce it way deep, like the French would pronounce. Their Hasanids. 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 Yeah. yeah Hasanids. Okay. Uh, they played uh, a, a role in the rise of Islam, as you said. Did their did their military learn skills from the two superpowers, Persia, and and in Rome, I know this is probably a silly question, but um, a lot of Islamic biographies, the Arabs are seen as kind of the underdogs who were up against these two superpowers, and their victories were because of God, right? And like I talked about before the show, I'm looking to not deal with the theology, but unmask and figure out like what actually was on the ground, uh, that God was on their side, but that they did it all by themselves. It's almost like when we read biblical narrative, where it's like, it seems like the Israelites just sometimes even just stood there and God did the war for him. Uh, hard to believe that this is true, uh, but did they actually join forces? Like, did they have help with them uh, from these other superpowers or potentially from other people in their, in their wars and conquering and stuff? Oh yeah. Uh, the, the Romans um, used primarily foot soldiers. Uh, they had of course also their cavalry, but um, the uh, Rasanids were, um, uh, practically only cavalry. And so they were a very um, useful um, uh, supplement to the, uh, uh, to the Roman army. And that's why uh, when they fought, they were very proud 
Uh, in fact, they were so proud that in uh, 580, 81, uh, the Romans e even decided, uh, the Byzantines uh, even decided, well, we have to cut these Rasanids down a notch or two. And they ended the phylarchy. Um, usually historians interpret this as a major mistake that uh, the, uh, the Byzantines committed because it allowed the Lachmids to, uh, 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 to develop uh, their superiority in the years after the 580s. Nevertheless, they uh, remained critical, the Rasanids, critical um, all the way up to Heraclius when he began in 610 uh, the war of liberation from the Persians. Uh, they uh, were enrolled and played a, a major part uh, in uh, this war of liberation that Heraclius led. And in fact, um, there's even a scholar, um, you might actually also uh, try to interview him. Uh, um, uh, 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 Tommaso Tesei, T-E-S-E-I is his last name. Uh, he's now with a uh, Korean university, but I think he is, uh, I don't know whether he's Italian based now or still in the United States, but he's associated with this Korean university. If you if you Google him, you um, I'm, I'm sure you can find him. So Tese is his last name, T-E-S-E-I, Tommaso, Thomas. Oh, okay. Um, he has written quite a bit about uh, this critical role of the Rasanids. Uh, he thinks that they were very important for this. Uh, I don't, have you come across this famous verse according to which allegedly, uh, in quotation marks, Muhammad, okay, the nameless preacher, um, uh, issued a prophecy uh, shortly before um, um, the uh, Hijra of 622 uh, that the Romans were victorious now, that is in 628. Uh, 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 when I say a prophecy, a prophecy is always issued after the yeah. facts have happened. Okay. Ex eventu. <laughs> exactly. Um, so he prophesied that uh, initially the 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 Persians would be successful, but ultimately the Romans would be victorious. Uh, this verse, um, as I said, uh, allegedly a prophecy, is uh, always taken as meaning that uh, uh, the unnamed preacher, uh, Hamid, predicted that eventually the Romans would be victorious. And so therefore, the implication is uh, the, the people in Mecca were sympathetic toward the Romans and not the Persians. We have not a shred of evidence about that. That is historically undocumented. Uh, in fact, uh, it was probably the other way around. So in other words, it said that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, eventually uh, the uh, conquering Arabs would defeat the Byzantines uh, and indeed, they did in uh, 636. So the um, uh, the the new reading of, of the crime, which is not original with me, I mean, it's well known, but scholars are divided uh, whether they should read it as this uh, prophecy uh, about the uh, Persians being defeated and the Romans eventually, uh, or the other way around. Um, uh, that uh, is what... Uh, um, Tizi has research. And this is important because um, in uh, 622 then, uh, when the Hydra happened, and then in the subsequent years until the official date of uh, Muhammad's death in 632, so 10 years later, these were the years, uh, 10 years, of gradual conquests by Medina, beginning with the surroundings of Medina, Mecca, perhaps. Um, we are not sure about this. Uh, we have not a shred of um, uh, proof. The only thing that the Quran says is that there was, was an, an encounter by the people of Medina and the people of Mecca in the valley of Mecca. That's the only mention that uh, uh, the word Mecca uh, has in, in the Quran. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, ultimately, of course, the uh, people of Medina prevailed. 
Anyway, the, uh, the important point here is when uh, this gradual expansion of Medina occurred, uh, somewhere around 629, uh, it's very difficult to determine exactly, a messenger was sent to the Ghassanids uh, telling them, uh, give up your version of Christianity, adopt ours, because the message that Muhammad preached was there's only one God and uh, that Jesus was a prophet and uh, whether we, he was uh, killed or not, in the, in, uh, as, it, uh, as the Quran says, uh, that is unknown. So it was not yet clear at this time, 629, uh, what the situation was. So he sent a messenger up to these Christian Hassanids, telling them, uh, join us against the Romans. And we together conquer Rome because it's a promised land. The Jews have forfeited Jerusalem. Uh, the Romans uh, have uh, conquered it, but now we are coming and we are conquering uh, Jerusalem from the Romans. Help us be our associates. So that was the functioning, the, the, the final function of the Ghazanids. They helped the conquering Medinans in the 630s to conquer Syria. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that you don't hear every day. Okay, nope. okay. So uh, let's uh, let's dive a little deeper here, if, if you don't mind. Now yeah. I'd like to move on to the possibility of the location of Mecca and Medina not being okay. in modern-day Saudi Arabia, but somewhere else. And I have some early sources which I found in Robert Hoyland's Seeing Islam as Others Saw It that I'd like to show. The first is about Mecca, and this is found in the Byzantine Arab uh, Chronicle 741. And this one right here, he came finally to Mecca, the home of Abraham, as they think, which lies between Ur of the Chaldees and the city of Haran, uh, of <laughs> yeah. in, the, in, the, in the desert. So yeah. if I may, uh, you know, where exactly is the location of Mecca as described in this chronicle? And here's a map to give you kind of a something to maybe go off of. Yeah. Do you, do you have an idea or? Well, let's see here. Then. Uh Oh, I know you got to get, get the glasses get, on. Get my glasses, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the map actually shows Hera, to which I referred a little earlier. Mm -hmm. That was the capital of the Lahmids. Right. And uh, as I said, the Lahmids were, well, let's be loose here in, in one's nomenclature, Nestorians. So the, one, the ones who believed in uh, the um, half divine, half uh, human nature of, of Jesus. Uh, they did not play uh, any direct part in the whole um, uh, conquest. So it's only the Rasanids to whom I referred a little earlier because they participated in the Medinan army in the 630s in the conquest of Syria from the Romans. Okay. Um, I just so, switched so maps map, to maybe give you a better, because yeah. the names are there, the Ghassanids or whatever, and the Lachmids. Uh, on the left or Western side, you see the Ghassanids right. are the top, left western part of of uh saudi arabia if you will yeah um okay so yeah, so, back, so back to this quotation that you showed me in uh, the chronicle of 741 uh which is uh, very important because we have for these early years after the completion of the arab conquest of syria uh no reliable sources for the arabs we have only christian sources commenting on the conquering arabs and there, by the way, we are opening uh, also an extremely interesting chapter about which you might want to ask me later. But um, this chronicle that you, where you uh, mentioned this quote, um, it shows that the Christians of this period who reported about it, now the, the chronicle of 741 is already a chronicle of 40 years after the first mentioning of Mecca. I, I said earlier, uh, we don't have any proof that Mecca existed during the 600s. Um, it is mentioned once, but only in the, uh, in the Quran, only in the form of in the valley of Mecca. So right. that does not mean that there was a city or, or a sanctuary. Uh, 
we only can indirectly conclude that perhaps there was a sanctuary because uh, the the uh, valley of of Mecca was the place uh, where the Quran says that the Medina people met and were about to battle the Mecca people, but God interfered and uh, withheld uh, the Meccans from attacking because they were also sympathizers for uh, uh, Muhammad in Mecca, and therefore um, he didn't want to have any uh, blood to be spilled. That's essentially this particular verse that I'm referring to. Okay. That's all we know. So we know about Mecca then eventually uh, through this Edessene Apocalypse 692. And then subsequently, and this source of 741 uh, clearly shows it, uh, Christians knew that there was a Mecca. Now the Christians of the 600s who commented on the conquering Arabs after 640 knew nothing about Mecca. Uh, a first inkling that there was um, uh, something going on there, way south, north of Medina, came only in 683 when there was a counter caliph um, uh, who uh, disputed the power with the Umayyads. And um, uh, uh, he allegedly was in this place in, in the south, but it's not named, where there was a sanctuary. So we know that there was a sanctuary in the south, north of Medina. That's about all. And, um, and Hoyland, who showed you this particular source, um, was a bit late here. 741 is already way beyond uh, the, the, uh, the original emergence of Islam. So that's when we can say, OK, at that time, yes, there was a Mecca, there was a Medina, there was an Umayyad Caliphate. It was the dominant one in the Middle East and so on. And Hoyland has written quite a good book about it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm using it uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but um, he uh, nowhere goes into the details about the Maya Fizites, the Nestorians, etc., right. etc. Et <laughs> so let me let's probe a little deeper here because I also have a description of where the Arabs were located from uh, a Frankish chronicle written in 650 AD, where exactly is the location of the Saracens is described in this chronicle. So let me show you that. This one right here, and it says the Hagarines, if I'm, I'm saying that right, the Hagarines. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh, another name, by the way, for the Arabs. After Hagar, the uh, slave wife of uh, Abraham. I'd like to get into that a little bit, too, if we have the time. Um, yeah. the, the Hagarines, the Hagarines, who are also called Saracens, which were also the Arabs, a circumcised people, uh, which is quite interesting as well. That kind of tells you something who of old had lived beneath the Caucasus on the shores of the Caspian in a country known as Ercolia. <laughs> and yeah. I think, I, I figure I'd just show the map again to give you, is there a way to describe where that would be on this map? Or maybe I go to this map. Where would they, where, where would it be describing? Okay, you would have to go into, let's say, the... Northwestern uh, uh, border of uh, it says actually if um, your readers can read it Albania, you see that right next to the Caspian Sea. I'm looking now. So it would be between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Okay. Okay. And there it says on the coast of the, of uh, the Caspian Sea, Albania. Got it. Okay. That's where roughly this particular source locates them. Um, that has to do a lot with apocalyptic speculations at that time. Uh, that's again another chapter, the famous Alexander legend um, uh, uh, up there in the, in, in the Northwest. So yes, there were lots of uh, Christian speculations in the six and seven hundreds, uh, particularly in the apocalypses uh, that became quite numerous in the early 700s, there's a lot of speculation then about uh, where the different places are to be located. Uh, there's, of course, also the famous um, uh, early map um, that allegedly uh, uh, locates Mecca under the name of Makuraba. Have you come across that? No. <laughs> oh, there's also a long sp speculations about that. Oh. So the, the so-called Ptolemaic map 
so no, um, but, but the upshot of all of this is um, uh, there's not a shred of evidence about where to lo locate all of that. Um, very vague knowledge in the 600s. Um, I'm at the point now also I published um, uh, or in the process of publishing uh, uh, two articles on this. The, uh, 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 even though the Arabs had completed the conquest of Syria in 640, nobody knew at the time that these conquering Arabs had a person by the name of Muhammad who was their prophet. They knew the name Muhammad, but they always described him as a king or a military leader. Perhaps he was. Shoemaker is making a big point of that, that Muhammad was allegedly alive when the beginning of the conquest in, in Syria occurred. But Shoemaker is, in my opinion, dead wrong when he says that um, there was already a text at that time, uh, perhaps 634 or maybe following years around 640, this, the famous or infamous Doctrina Jacobi. Did he mention it? Uh, yeah, we've talked about it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, that mentions uh, the Prophet Muhammad. But uh, there are very good reasons to say the Doctrina Jacobi does not come uh, or was not composed in, uh, in these early years, in the 630s. But instead, probably between, let's say, 670, 695 uh, in Carthage, because Carthage during these years, 670 to 695, was hanging on to the city by their fingernails to save it from the conquering Arabs. Mm. That's when it was written. Anti-Judaism was extremely powerful in the course of the 600s. And uh, did, did uh, any of your interviewers Viewers um, uh, mentioned Sabios. Yes, the, the bishop. Okay. Yes, uh, I have great doubts um, uh, about him. That text, of course, comes from the six sixties. He he mentions Muhammad, but he does not say he was a prophet. That's very if I, important. If I may, just yeah. just for the sake of the show, just so everybody understands, here it is. Good. For the first time in okay. Armenia, someone talks about uh, Muhammad and mentions him by name, and says a little bit about what he did. Sebeos himself was talking about the events around the year 630, which was before Muhammad had actually died. Sibius gives a surprisingly accurate account of Muhammad's background and teachings. Translating from the Armenian. At that time, a certain man whose name was Mahmet, which is the usual name for Muhammad in Armenian, a merchant, as if by the command of God, appeared to them as a preacher. Now, Muhammad gave them laws, namely, not to eat carrion, not to drink wine, not to speak falsehood, and not to engage in fornication. Uh, is, is that Thompson? It is. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm using uh, his uh, translation. Uh, well, he's uh, uh, he had, of course, colleagues uh, also in uh, uh, in the process of uh, making Savios available. Uh, his uh, edition or uh, translation of of the text is extremely important, and I use it all the time, and I find it very helpful. Uh, what uh, Thompson doesn't mention is um, Savios can be doubted because. Uh, he is, of course, the one who says that um, uh, the uh, uh, Arabs conquered uh, Jerusalem because um, they uh, considered it the promised land. And I mentioned it briefly earlier in our discussion. Uh, I, my feeling is uh, that he wrote that, uh, or that he, uh, let's put it in quotation marks, invented that particular aspect of his description of the rise of Muhammad and the Arabs, which, by the way, is embedded also in an, in an apocalyptic thinking. Sabios thought that the world would come to an end very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, that in these last times, the Arabs were destined by God to conquer Jerusalem because the Jews had forfeited it because they killed Jesus, 
The Romans had lost it because they lost the war. Um, Heraclius was defeated. We now, the Arabs, uh, sorry, they, the Arabs, Sabios, of course, uh, talks about uh, the Arabs uh, right. as an Armenian. The Armenians, by the way, were Maiphysites, very important here also to consider in this whole attitude that uh, uh, Sabios uh, took, because Sabios was very anti-Jewish. So in my opinion, he invented this entire story about the promised land. Uh, and one has to be very careful about uh, 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 proving it or making a good case for it, uh, because actually the Quran is uh, not very clear about uh, why the Arabs um, conquered Jerusalem or what they exactly wanted to do with Jerusalem once they had conquered it. Um, uh, Sabios and uh, the Jews, uh, of course, were of the opinion that they, that uh, the Arabs wanted to rebuild the temple for mm -hmm. a third time, I guess, or whatever. Uh -uh. Uh, the Arabs knew what they were doing. As I said, they were uh, not only anti maya Fizad, also anti chalcedonian except Jerusalem, which I mentioned is this exception because of the Trisagion. Uh, but um, they wanted to have something completely new. They wanted to have their own sanctuary there. And of course, Abd al-Malik built the famous Dome of the Rock, which is one of the most famous sanctuaries that the Muslims possess. And one should not mix it up with a temple. It was a sanctuary that uh, uh, possibly could have been uh, a, a pilgrimage center Gerald Horting, uh, whom you should also, by the way, interview if you have a chance. H-A-W-T-I-N-G. Uh, he has recently written a very interesting article where he wonders whether the Dome of the Rock uh, wasn't supposed to be a, a pilgrimage center competing with Mecca that was barely existing at the end of the 600s. Uh, you remember, 692 is the right. earliest date when Mecca was mentioned. So Horting is also uh, on to something very interesting in, in this whole origin of Islam uh, debate. And um, uh, Sabios, by contrast, um, even though the scholarship, of course, of Thompson is uh, um, extremely uh, important and uh, valuable, um, Sabios uh, can be uh, interpreted in uh, quite a few different ways than he was proposing. Wow. Okay. So that would be a little contrary to Shoemaker's apocalyptic approach saying that. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So you don't think that Muhammad was like an ends day prophet thinking that the end was going to happen? No, no, no. He, no, no. That is indubitable. But, okay. No, but, but there you are now. I was <laughs> thinking that the mission, there's this mission concept that, that he talks about this, or at least it's in line with what we've seen with Crone. And uh, Patricia Crone and and um, and um, Cook and uh, Michael looking, Cook, yeah. right? And then of course Hoyland had the. He's not so sure. He's very open to being uh, not sure about anything. But it seemed to me when I read some of this literature where it talks about the Saracens or the the uh, the Ishmaelites and the uh, Jews are going to conquer together. It seemed like they had some type of. Um, almost like an, uh, here's our contract. We have a contract to, to capture Jerusalem. Uh, and then there's some apocalyptic, it sounds like apocalyptic, but it could be what I think Shoemaker thought was a copy of Joshua's conquest, this idea of going up and conquering Jerusalem again. And it lists like the 12 tribes of the Ishmael. That's Sabios, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So you think that's a complete fictional... Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's entirely fictional. Okay. Now, Shoemaker... Uh, Schumacher is perfectly correct by saying that um, the uh, motivation for the conquest, although we have in, uh, in indicators of that motivation only from the 630, uh, 6, 634 onwards, so not the early period uh, uh, after the uh, establishment of Muhammad, uh, of the preacher in Medina. But Schumacher is perfectly right. Uh, the the, at that time, in the 630s, the, uh, the Arabs were driven by the idea that the world would come to an end soon, because that's, after all, what the Quran is all about. The world will end soon. 
Um, we hear it still today. Um, like the Hadith says, I, oh, I did this, you know, see the gap right. between my finger. That's how uh -huh. close. Right, exactly. And, uh, but of course, on the other hand, the Quran, uh, the un unnamed preacher is very careful. He never says it will happen tomorrow. It will happen very soon. Now, there you, you are entering some, uh, something, again, new, that is very important to take in. And that actually is something that Shoemaker, in my opinion, didn't consider sufficiently. And that is um, the, uh, the, the Quran up to 622 is actually a Quran that preaches, yes, the end of the world, and is also opposed, of course, to uh, the Mushrikun, those uh, associators who think that uh, uh, next to God, there was also a divine Jesus. And, so that means uh, different versions of Christianity, obviously. Exactly. So that uh, uh, the, the entire early period prior to 622 was a peaceful period. So the preaching of the end of the world was be patient. Uh, let me help the unnamed preacher. Let me help to spread the message because, yes, uh, if the world ends tomorrow, you don't want to sin anymore. You want to repent. You want to ask God for forgiveness. You want to enter the kingdom of God when uh, the uh, eschaton, the end, comes. And uh, that, of course, will be accompanied by horrible events. And we all know what these various earthquakes and uh, splitting of the moon and whatever else uh, uh, there is. So Schumacher is perfectly all right. That's the what one calls eschatology. Mm -hmm. But, which Schumacher is not uh, entirely clear, it was only in 622 that the peaceful preaching, okay, you cannot uh, hit people over the head and force them to believe that the world will end tomorrow. All you can do is preach it peacefully and hope that uh, the people to whom you preach it will be persuaded what, by what you are doing. And that is actually the great mass of verses in the Quran. Uh, the, uh, only in 622, when Muhammad established himself in Medina, and that we know, 622 is a firm date. It's externally uh, verifiable. The, again, the Nestorians uh, are the ones who get, deliver the documentation for us, uh, uh, to us for this. Only then jihad was preached. And this is extremely important. There's a, a, a German scholar who made his name in um, uh, analyzing the uh, great prophets of the Old Testament, Karl Friedrich Pohlmann, P-O-H-L-M-A-N-N, -N, who just about two or three years ago uh, wrote a very important book by saying the Quran actually consists of two uh, major elements. The peaceful preaching, which makes up the great mass of the of the verses, and then in 622, uh, the preaching of holy war, which is mostly concentrated in surahs eight and nine, and that that was a uh, a, a fateful event in uh, the. Uh, hold on, just a moment. You're fine. Uh, let me double check something that my wife just gave me. Listen, my I've got a, a wife as okay. well. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, she gave me some important information. Okay, so um Pullman um therefore then said uh we can uh, we have to presuppose uh, that in the Quran that was formed essentially between the years or up to the years, let's say the six sixties, seventies, or whatever, that was the period when when the composition of the Quran took place. So after the conquest, when nobody knew anything about the Arabs, that's the time when the Quran came together. Uh, that during that time, there was a fierce struggle between the so-called peace party and the so-called jihad party. And we can identify verses in the Quran where the two directly clashed. There is one, uh, let me get my glasses, and uh, want to be <laughs> sure that everybody knows about this. It's uh, Surah 48, verse 4 and verse 74. If you read these two verses, 
you have a dear proof of the peace party, verse 4 in Surah 48, clashing with the end of the same Surah, 4874, where the exact opposite is being said. What is being said in these two verses? The first one is, um, God will be pleased if you continue preaching, essentially. Uh, the last verse means, or close to the end, 74, means God will only be pleased. You will be a good Muslim only if you go on jihad. So there is a direct clash in the Quran. Pullman makes the point there, were, there was a peace party, a jihad party, and they were battling it out during the years roughly 620s, 30s, 40s, 50s, until we have the first uh, signs that there is a, with a Quran in formation, probably in the 680s. Now, back to uh, Shoemaker. Uh, Shoemaker considers only the jihad party. He does not consider the peace party in, in this whole uh, in these whole events. And we should not pre presuppose that uh, the peace party disappeared just because there was a jihad. And that's the important um, uh, consideration that one needs to have when one deals with the alleged uh, uh, promise of Jerusalem to the conquering Arabs, uh, replacing the Jews and uh, the Byzantines. Real quick, uh, when you mentioned the final compilation, if we will, of the Quran. What do you do with the palimpsest, uh, the uh, lower lower yeah. text? How do you yeah. how do you address dating these? And you know, I, I guess you would disagree with some of the others on this. No, no, you're you're well informed, by the way. Uh, thank you for asking me about that. Uh, that is, of course, the period then the six eighties, which I mentioned. When now we know it through um, carbon dating, although carbon dating always has this the spread of years you can never really decide like exactly. 50 plus or minus or something exactly yeah so let's say around the 680s um yeah there is a as an upper text and a lower text uh, but um i don't think that uh, that the uh, the discovery of these two uh, texts uh, has added terribly much yes there are two versions and there is eventually of course also a, uh, an accepted version, but um, the um, uh, discarded version, so to speak, in the palimpsest is not that different. Right. And so uh, we have to say that probably much of the Quran was in existence at around that time in the 680s. Okay. Uh, let's move on to something else. And I got a couple more questions for you, if you don't mind. We have a modern day map of Iraq and we can see that there's a Yathrib there as well. If we add up everything, do you think the original locations of Mecca and Medina are up in the north in the region of Iraq? Here is that map just to kind of show you probably won't be able to see the text. Um, really small print here, but it is very north. Uh, it's, it's like up there toward Iraq. Uh, did you want to make a quick comment on that? Do you think that... Uh, uh, no, um, there, are, there are often um, repetitions of oh, I mean, particular names that appear in various places. Okay. Uh, so um, that is very unlikely. Um, so we, we can be, uh, I, th I think um, the Quran is, is pretty clear here, and also the early sources, uh, because the Quran uh, are Christian sources, so because we don't have the uh, Arab sources from the 600s. Uh, Medina is very clear. It's mentioned, uh, uh, Yathrib, sorry. Uh, Medina is, of course, uh, the, the Islamic name for the same city, the city of the prophet. Right. Medina, Medina and Nabi. So Yathrib uh, is an old oasis. Uh, we have um, uh, reports about uh, Yathrib in existence already um, uh, well, early Persian Empire, etc. Right. So there's no doubt about that. So Medina is well established and that it emerged as the place of jihad preaching. You see, that's where we only get hold of this unnamed preacher calling himself four times then in the Quran in the context of jihad. The name Muhammad appears only in these uh, verses of surahs 8 and 9 that deal with jihad. So the Quran is really split here in the sense uh, one wishes one could divide the Quran into the peaceful Quran and the jihad Quran and say, okay, the true Quran is the peace 
full Quran, the one that preaches and does not call for holy war. Um, the, um, uh, so uh, Medina is well established and uh, we don't, we, even though Yathrib, of course, uh, could appear also in other places, uh, that's very unlikely that we should take that seriously. Right. Uh, but also the point now concerning Mecca, since Mecca was not known to have been in existence, um, uh, Mecca is, of course, uh, and the Quran is the beginning of this. Houting uh, is very much of the opinion that this whole transfer of what Jerusalem is or was for the Jews to Mecca. So in other words, it's a pilgrimage place. One circumambulates the, uh, the sanctuary in Mecca. One runs between Safa and Marwa back and forth because one repeats uh, or commemorates Hagar's search for water for uh, the young born Ishmael and so on. Um, that is, of course, a conscious transfer of everything that once took place in Jerusalem to Mecca. And that is, of course, the Islam that we know today. That Islam, however, is not the Umayyad Islam of the 600s and 700s. It's the Islam of 750 and the Abbasids who then made Mecca the center of, of Islam. And they are the two creators of the Islam that we speak about today. So, um, but, at, but, but at that time, jihad was long over. Right, right. Okay, this is interesting. Some people say that Muhammad is a title like Caesar is to the Roman emperors and that Muhammad is not his real name. Muhammad means the praise one, as you said, and his real name is shown in this hadith. So I'm going to pop up this hadith. I'm going to try and read this small, fine print. Um, this is probably not the best version of it. Uh, let me get the highlighted version here real quick. Uh, let me do this. Uh, sorry, forgive me for one second while I get this actual version that has the highlight because I want people to be able to see what I'm doing here. Okay, I got this and I am about to pop it up here now. I actually went and actually added the highlighted part to make it um, visible for anybody who's watching this podcast to be able to see. It seems pretty obvious to me there's something going on here. Okay, so I'm just going to read the lower part here, uh, oh, yeah. and I might put your names here. <laughs> Abu Sufyan then added, when Heraclius had finished his speech and had read the letter, there was a great hue in the Ori in the royal court. So we were turned out of the court. I told my companions that the question of Ibn Abi Kashba, Kamsha, the prophet yeah. Kamsha, uh the prophet muhammad has become so prominent that even the king bani al asfar byzantine is afraid of him and this yeah. is in a hadith so is that another name for the prophet muhammad <laughs> yeah the 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 red skinned people the bani al asfar <laughs> okay um yeah no that is um uh the so called islamic tradition Right. Uh, the Islamic tradition um, began probably in the 670s, 80s. Again, we are talking here about uh, decisive events at the end of the 600s, where we then have sources that we can be talking seriously about. So at that time, so we are talking there now about a generation of people after Muhammad who are maybe the grandchildren of the people who lived at the same time and were his companions of Muhammad, uh, or maybe the great-grandchildren. Now, we cannot presume that those grandchildren, great-grandchildren, remembered anything accurately. <laughs> Right. Um, even if they were serious and did not want to invent. Now, we have to bear, the, bear in mind, of course, there was great competition among the people who con uh, when they were conquering uh, to be the most glorious, the most victorious, the most successful, what have you. And so uh, this so-called Islamic, I mean, not so-called, this Islamic tradition that came into being is extremely unreliable. We cannot determine what is genuine and what is not, what is invented and what might be serious. Yes, there are esteemed colleagues in the field uh, who say, well, uh, in cases where the traditions contradict each other and where later traditionists went with, let's say, one, one version 
and uh, uh, rejected the other, that the rejected versions is perhaps closer to the truth. Well, to a degree that is debatable. But overall, the Islamic tradition is extremely unreliable. And this whole business about uh, Abu Kabsh is merely one example. There are other names as well uh, that uh, were allegedly given to this unnamed preacher. But we have to bear in mind that the Quran, uh, you see, this is one of the very attractive parts of the Quran. The Quran deliberately is vague about anything historical. So when I mentioned a little earlier this business about Petra being the place where the first revelations happened, the Quran uses the word uh, Um al-Qara, which literally means mother of the villages or mother of the towns. Now, uh, officially, the Islamic tradition, later than Islamic theologians, said, oh, yeah, no, that's a clear reference to Mecca. And so ever since, um, uh, still in modern scholarship, uh, it's believed that that means, uh, that particular verse in the Quran means Mecca. Well, uh, Petra was conquered by the Rome, uh, when the Romans conquered and defeated, um, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, conquered Syria, uh, they conquered, of course, also Petra. And shortly after that, uh, in 114, I believe, uh, 114 the, of the Islamic? Uh, uh, no, no. Are you uh, talking about 114 uh, AD? Okay, because that's uh, AD, yeah. two calendars here. It's like, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, at that time, so this was after the Romans conquered, of course, uh, uh, Palestine. Uh, this uh, is before Jerusalem the wars in 130 or whatever. This is in between the wars that are happening in yeah. Jerusalem. Okay. Um, the uh, It was customary for the Roman emperors to uh, give... Uh, elevated titles to some of the cities that had been conquered in the Roman Empire. So Petra received the title of Metropolis. Well, if you translate Metropolis, it means Mater Polis, Polis, mother of the cities. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what the Quran says. Um, in technical terms, it's a calc, as we say. So in other words, uh, the unnamed preacher uh, took uh, the name of Petra, mother of the cities, translated into Arabic, and that's what Petra is. There is another indication that actually we are not wrong. It's not a misinterpretation uh, because uh, in other verses uh, there appears the word Rakim. I don't know whether anybody has mentioned that to you. I don't know uh, about it. Uh, R-A-Q-I-M. It's allegedly the name of the of the dog, of the uh, at the entrance of the cave. No, uh, in, in uh, company the so-called seven sleepers, the Church of Ephesus. Um, you, you are aware. Of I the know legend? about this. Yes. Okay. It, yeah. There's got to be a genetic mimetic connection between the Quran and the earlier Christian tradition. Right. So the, in quotation marks, real cave is in Ephesus. So there we are, way north in Anatolia. Uh, the indications of the Quran, as it exists, um, uh, wanted to move the Seven Sleeper story to, uh, or wanted to be known, it, it was probably uh, already uh, the case, uh, that this uh, particular cave was actually in Petra or near Petra. And so Rakim is actually the name for Petra in Aramaic. Hmm. So you have an indication here because Rakim is mentioned in the uh, in uh, in the Quran uh, in conjunction with the uh, cave in which the seven sleepers were as uh, uh, the as part of the inscription of the names of the people who were in the cave. And unfortunately there are um, Islamic scholars Griffiths for example who believe that uh, this inscription scholar, but de facto, Arakim was a well-known uh, ancient name for Petra. So there you have another element that indicates that we are talking about the, the, the so-called peaceful Quran being revealed in what I, saw, what I call Madian or Palestina Tertia um, until in 622 the preacher turned up in Medina and ultimately then in conjunction with the beginning conquest, 
uh, took on the name Muhammad, the praised one. Ooh. So that this would be the story. <laughs> amazing. Okay, last last thing here. And, okay. and then, then then I just have a couple questions as I let you go here. Some people suggest even Abi or Kasha, the word Kasha, yeah. Yeah, is another form of the individual in Tabari volume five. And if I may show that here, um, I'm gonna the first words there is obviously it's written in it seems a different language in particular, the way it's pronouncing this. But uh, as governor over all Hira and the other former territories of Al Numan or Numan. Yeah. So I didn't know if you thought they were the same person or no. if that was okay. Um, a very different one. Um, Kisra is, of course, the name for Khosro II. Uh, Not a man was the last Lahmid king. And uh, that's an interesting little detail. Um, the, when the Romans um, cut down the Rasanids and made them lower level defenders, so to speak of uh, the Byzantine Empire, although not so low that they wouldn't be still um, faithful and help in uh, help Heraclius in the reconquest. Okay, so when, Her when uh, Hosro um, saw that the Romans had done that to the Rasanis, he decided, well, I don't need uh, the Lachmids either as kings say on, the, on, the, on my Western border. Uh, they are pretentious anyway with the title king. So let me get rid of, the, of these guys as well. So he poisoned or otherwise killed, we don't know exactly, Norman, who's mentioned in what you showed me, that particular uh, passage in Tabati. Uh, and that happened in 602. Uh, the Lachmids were outraged about this and went uh, and immediately rose uh, militarily against Khosrow. Took quite a while for Khosrow to be uh, until they ultimately uh, was uh, able to defeat them. And it was only then uh, in uh, 610, so eight years later, uh, that um, he was uh, quite successful. But then there was yet another Arab revolt. And in 610, they inflicted a defeat on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the Persians, on the Sasanids. Uh, that particular defeat is reported only in Tabari. So Islamic tradition, we are not absolutely sure. Tabari has to be read with extreme caution. So we don't know whether this uprising really occurred, or this victory uh, over by the Arabs over the Persians uh, really happened. But... Tabari, and then also a Christian source, actually, the Chronicle of Seyert, say this 610 was the beginning of the preaching career of the preacher in Mecca. Mm. Uh, sorry, in Medina. Yeah. Uh, so you have an interesting connection there between uh, the Persians, Sanzanids, and uh, the Lahmids, and so on, uh, in the early 600s and the alleged beginning preaching career of uh, this unnamed preacher in 610, allegedly in Mecca, but we don't know because we have proof of anything happening down there in, in Mecca, Medina, only in 622 when the Arab kingdom emerged. All right, so let's recap for a second. Okay. As, as we, there's no more images, there's just, just recapping. Okay. What we, what we see is Christianity in its various forms. The wrestling point is on Jesus. I wish I had all these images I've used in Robert Hoyland episodes to pop up to get your thoughts on. And I've done this with Shoemaker and I've done it with Michael Penn. And I, I mean, I really delete all of this stuff when I'm done. And then I, you know, redo something for other scholars to get your thoughts. But what I understand is this, you know, when I wrestle in my head, I've heard theories that people try to say, well, there was a version of Judaism or a Jewish Christianity that escaped when all that happened, kind of like what we see with the uh, uh, the Ebionites, etc., right? And they survived all the way through history, all the way down to 7th century. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a little tough to accept. All the academics I talk to say, no, 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 that's not, that's not the case. Most academics deny that outright. There's no Jewish Christianity that survives for seven centuries down in. But... I always ask myself, you know, the Ishmaelites, those who are from um, 
uh, Hagar or Hagarism, as you know, Crone talks about. But the Hagars and the and the Jews together are like uniting under certain fronts. But Jesus is in the picture. And by this time, Jews don't seem, from what I understand historically, big fans of Jesus. In fact, he's blamed all throughout the Talmud for why the temple's destroyed. I mean, at least in certain locations, depends on the rabbi oh, yeah. you talk to. Yeah. So I thought, why is Islam obsessed with having Jesus in the picture? I can't see how a Jew practicing Judaism would even venerate the guy or even bring him in. So it makes better entrance if I if I were to try and find a causality that it was some form of Christianity. Right. And, and there's even uh, Fred uh, Donner. I've, I emailed him to try and get a hold of him. I haven't got a response yet. He has this hypothesis. There's multiple monotheistic groups that are probably under one umbrella or something. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of that? What do you think yeah. of some of this stuff? Um, uh, Hoyland is very skeptical. And in, in fact, most of the people in the field. Uh, Donner developed a thesis uh, in 1994, actually, already, which is actually built on, um, are you familiar with the, uh, Yehuda Nevo, who wrote an important study? I of have religion? not. Okay. Uh, he's dead now, so you cannot interview him. <laughs> but um, uh, Donna developed the thesis according to which these years of 640, roughly, let's say, or 638, the end of the Arab conquest to, well, we were then talking about the end of the 600s, which is this big black hole, so to speak, where we don't have any uh, Arab sources and where we have to rely on the Christian sources. Adonis' argument there is uh, precisely because there are no uh, Arab sources, because the Islamic tradition is so doubtful. Uh, and he's willing to admit that now. Uh, and in an earlier phase of his career, he actually worked um, almost entirely with Islamic traditions. So. Uh, he argued now that this, these 50 years roughly, this half century that is the black hole, was the period of an ecumenic Arab conquering society. So in other words, uh, there were these uh, Arab conquerors, but they did not think anything about Maya-Fizites or Nestorians or Jews. Right. They simply let all of these communities practice their religion freely they enrolled them even, no questions asked, in their army and administration. All they required was to recognize the caliph and to subscribe to the idea of the unity of God, the oneness of God, which of course then ultimately was the, uh, the uh, central thesis in, uh, in, in the Quran. But there is no proof for it. We don't know. There is no source. Yes, the conquering Arabs made freely use of Christians and Jews who wanted to participate in the administration, or in the case of Christians, the Hassanids in the army. And um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, that doesn't prove anything about what they believed or didn't believe. And in fact, you see, uh, they are, in my opinion, they are... Uh, very important details which one can prove. I'm thinking of three examples that I've just uh, demonstrated stand against this idea of, an, of ecumenicism, I guess one would have to call it. Not at all. There were fierce uh, confessional clash, clashes during this time. So um, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Umayyads who eventually emerged in the uh, mid-600s um, uh, uh, participated uh, lustily in uh, all of these discussions about uh, who Jesus was. Was he divine? Was he not? Was he put on the cross or, or not? So everybody at that time was sort of vaguely of the opinion that the, um, uh, that the uh, Arabs were some sort of Christians. John of Damascus in uh, the early part of the 700s was still of the opinion that they were Christians, but heretical. So that was sort of the, um, the, the gist of it in the 600s. And um, Donna, I, I don't think, uh, 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 did very well. And actually, this thesis has not gotten very far. Schumacher is a great uh, supporter of the thesis of the ecumenic mm -hmm. uh, form. But he is very concerned to make 
this whole Arab conquest eschatological end time empire, so to speak, uh, 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 sound like it is a logical evolution of jihad, which is doubtful in my opinion. But yeah, so it, rather than it being like the way it seemed was, and, and I'm painting it in my head that they were united. They were united at first. They got along. Everybody's under the umbrella. We're going to go conquer Jerusalem against these, uh, what we call Orthodox Christians, but they have a Trinitarian. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And they're like, no, we're going together. And, and there is some strange things that I thought were interesting. Maybe you interpret the data differently is like, there are tombs facing Jerusalem. There are, uh, from what I understand, even the prayer was facing Jerusalem initially, and that changed later. Like, this is this idea that, and this gets into that question I asked them, and if you don't mind addressing some of these facing Jerusalem ideas, but also just one caveat I want to add to that is the idea is that they're, they're getting along, they're facing Jerusalem, they have a mission together, and then something happens in this community where now they have friction. So the Islamic narrative has Muhammad die in 632. And I've actually had Muslims engage and go, why would you say 632? Uh, and why would you say later than, than 632? Our Islamic sources say he died in 632. And I'm like, well, should we trust those or not? And the question is, are there Christian sources that seem to say he was alive during the conquest of Jerusalem, was Muhammad alive? This has been like a recent discussion I've had on some of the episodes. There's like 11 or 12 sources. What Some of them are probably later, like you said. But but um, is this they were united under the front and even Muhammad was going to lead them as this apocalyptic figure thinking we're going to rebuild and this is going to like bring the empire idea as Shoemaker talks about that's going to cause the greatest empire and God's going to come down from heaven and it's going to establish heaven on earth and the whole nine that's what I had in mind when I was interviewing them, but you make me want to re get a whole new canvas and like get a brush and like repaint it starting from theological disputes within Christian communities. I don't yeah. know. There's so many questions I have. It's, it's just, yeah. where do we go? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the, uh, since we are coming to the end uh, of the yeah. whole discussion now, uh, the whole question of uh, the direction of prayer hangs together, of course, with the whole idea. Is Mecca the place where uh, the center of it all is, or is Jerusalem this place? And that was a debate that took place in the 600s, and it was it culminated, actually, then in the period between uh, 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 685 and uh, 7, uh, 705, which is the period of Abd al-Malik, the famous caliph, and it is under this caliph where we have the first uh, inklings, really, of Islam, the famous inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, controversies about um, uh, uh, is uh, really Mecca the center or is uh, Jerusalem the center? And that was carried out then in the course of the 700s. In fact, you see, it was even unsettled in 750, and that's the main reason why the Umayyads were overthrown, mm. because... The party that emerged at that time, the, the revolution in, uh, in Iraq and Iran, and which brought the Abbasids to power, was a revolution to make Mecca the center. And, uh, and, and the whole negativity that the Abbasids had subsequently developed towards the Umayyads. And then that's why there is now the scholarship on the Umayyads to rehabilitate them, so to speak. Hoyland is a great uh, promoter of this idea. Um, all of this has to do with these fights in the, in the emerging Islamic tradition, the emerging Islam, over the proper direction of prayer, the proper way of uh, performing all of these rituals. Um, we didn't touch, for, uh, for example, on the parallel and competitive pilgrimage uh, with Mecca, that's the pilgrimage to Arafat and uh, and Mina, uh, which is these are places outside, and that's where the famous throwing of pebbles against the devil occurs, about which I'm sure you are familiar. I've heard of it. Yeah. So uh, these are all uh, these are all elements uh, that belong into this long struggle 
which then evolved uh, once Abdel Malik was beginning to create the, the institutions that we call, okay, that's Islam then in uh, around 700. Man, I can't tell you how much <laughs> I want you to have. I definitely want you to come back, Dr. Ben Sievers. What? I, I, I really enjoyed this. And uh, for those okay. who don't know, be sure, please go check out the video. You want to hear the lecture he gives. Uh, this is at BYU Kennedy Center. Really, really interesting just getting into this. I like your approach. It's very hands-on, and, and it, it kind of puts the focus on what was really going on at the moment. It's not this satellite view guessing game of uh, are these Ebionite Christians who, you know, like, no, this is like what's going on on the ground at the time. And please go check out his academia.edu website. If there were any final words you'd like to tell our audience before we go, because I want you to come back. I don't want to burn this bridge. <laughs> okay. Okay. What, uh, what I want to say is, um, uh, well, keep reading the Quran, keep believing in the Quran, but become aware that uh, jihad in the Quran is a relatively minor uh, segment it, it, mostly in the beginning of the Quran, and not accidentally, by the way, uh, in surahs uh, eight and nine. Um, but the rest is peaceful preaching, and it's not conquest. And so, when it became conquest, it was a conquest to make Islam superior among all other religions. That's what the Quran says explicitly. So it's not the Arabs who should be victorious, but it's the faith that should be superior to the others. And it's also not proselytizing, uh, because if you conquer, you cannot proselytize easily. You subject people, you don't preach to them. But the uh, most of the Quran is actually preaching peacefully prior to 622. And I assume it began already in the early 600s or thereabouts in, as I said, Madiano, Palestinian, Tertia, so way north, northwest in Petra. That's what uh, perhaps uh, Muslims who, who are open to uh, uh, rethinking their faith should think about. So I'm not attacking the Quran at all. It is a very important uh, scripture, but uh, I read it for reading about where well, the, uh, what is it what I should do with my life when I have to think tomorrow is the end of it well, we are in a political situation by the way where the world can end and where we have to think about um, a tactic, tactical nuclear bomb exploding over Warsaw perhaps um, nuclear stuff raining over all of Europe um, we don't know. The end of the world is not something that we can easily dismiss as a, uh, a thing that, that, that um, will not happen. So that's what the Quran is really about. We should take it seriously. And uh, that is not something that uh, we should poo poo. Well, thank you so much. I really yep. appreciate your time, your information. And never forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are Mythficians.